I've been talking to Trick, uh, and others mostly Trick, about logic. Um, we've got a little bit of a semantic mess that would be great to clear up, or on the other hand, just move on to these actual substantial things. But one thing I claim is that we're in the middle of a revolution. Part of this revolution is this underground, it's controversial, if it's a real revolution, saying it's a revolution. It's a prediction that, it, you know, that it's going to continue and get bigger, and this is the discoveries of uh, cognitive... Uh, linguistics and psychology but I want to talk about uh, a less controversial part I mean the general picture is the whole postmodern era after the fall of um, you know classical mechanics classical theory um, you know, being replaced scientifically but not in practicality not in engineering with, in, with most engineering with quantum mechanics and relativity. This has thrown things uh, up in the air a little bit. The, the implications of things like Gödel's proof, stuff like this, uh, the signs are all out there. But in one particular area in this uh, that we're talking about, Trick and I, there's a, a particular thing in terms of the revolution and controversy in mathematics that has to be acknowledged by anybody that follows mathematics or logic closely and of course such a person should realize that mathematics is really where some of the most intense logic has gone. Now in the history of mathematics, mathematics got pretty far with just people playing with numbers and shapes and things and figuring out these axioms and then uh, figuring out more abstract axioms and proving the things they had figured out before from those and working their way back and back. But there was no coherent, wait, what is math? Why are these things related? What, what is a number and plus? What, is there some common thing that we can define both addition and the numbers that get added and the concept of equals and the result that it's supposed to be in some superset language, meta language? And Cantor um, and others in the late 1800s, you know, invented set theory. And it has taken over and today rigorous analysis of math uses set theory. Now this is a very interesting thing because all syllogisms, all propositional logic turns out to be depending on sets, defining sets. Now I say that, that the statements, the tautologies like the law of identity that, are, that we have, some people have wanted to use those to, uh, to as a way of uh, plugging the hole in logic. See logic, you got a good conclusion going back to the premises then you don't know if the premises are good. So you figure, well, I could probably prove those premises, and often you can. Some of the premises turn, you know, out, okay, they weren't right, and you improve them, and you often reproduce most of the premises, or at least their intent. But in logic, it's just by induction, every logical argument, the next logical argument has to start from these kinds of premises. So how are we going to have our absolute certainty when there's always this hole of unproved principles? It looks like we can go back and back, and by induction, we might reach it, but you don't know. Is that limited asymptotic or not? So they just say, well, we'll go back to these little logical nuggets, these tautologies that are true. And then they adopted this idea that math comes from those tautologies. Well, the evolutionary embodied mind approach looks at it differently, quite differently, and it's been demonstrated that in something like mathematics, we have abstracted the concept of a container. We use containers as metaphors and indeed it's been proven that you know most of mathematics uh, and all currently you know rigorous mathematics can be defined in terms of set theory. What the number two means, what it is, that you could define that in terms of set theory. Okay. In other words, all mathematics comes down to this container concept. And the concept of a container is older than the concepts of mathematics, and so the one is generating the other. So this container concept, by studying it, we come up with things like uh, the, the tautologies of classical um, objective metaphysics. Okay, so back to the story. So then we have set theory, and suddenly there's a unifying principle, a theory of everything for mathematics. And, you know, that covers Cartesian coordinates and radial coordinates and hyperbolic coordinates and weird dimensional spaces and it's all, boom, theory of everything, set theory. Then along comes Bertrand Russell with his, his great paradox, I'll let you look it up, but it's, 
it's based on this idea that he noticed, you know, in uh, in math with this abstracted idea of a container. You have this idea that something is either in or out of a set. It's either in, it, the whole thing depends on a thing is not blurry, law of excluded middle, it's either in or out of the set. And that's the rule. So there's sets that contain themselves, right? So like the set of uh, all sets contains itself. The set of things that are not France, like contains itself. The set of all fruits, okay, it doesn't contain itself because the set of all fruits is not a fruit. And then he asks a question about what about the set of all sets that don't contain themselves? And he got a paradox. Now it's a weird thing for us, but they are taking the faith of the abstraction of the container. Now a real container is the source metaphor. A real container meaning a human sized container you can interact with as a container. Now, such a thing like that, like a purse, you know, your keys are either in the purse or they're not. And we took that abstraction. Of course, in real life, maybe your keys are hanging in it halfway in and out of your purse. And whether it's in or out depends on what you're talking about. What, why do you mean? You mean in your purse so that when you pick it up, they'll remain in there? Or do you mean in your purse in the sense that some of the thing is, uh, is in something called the interior? doesn't matter if it's zipped or open all of these blurry factors in the abstraction we can forget but forgetting about that reality that blurry reality leads to Russell's paradox okay it's a very confusing thing for people who were trying to prove that there was some way to work on logic enough to get to the starting point and then just work back up the world and prove all these million things and basically, as a skeptic, I think, no, you'll always be able to break it down because it's an invention of man. You're not breaking it down. You're building up further abstractions. So you might get the building as high as you can engineer against the force of gravity, but there's still in principle there's a higher space because you could build more abstractions. Always. You're not going to finish. I've filled up the abstraction space. I don't think that's going to happen. All right. From an embodied mind, an evolutionary point of view, it's not confusing at all. The human body has this idea of containers for the practical reasons of our evolution. Managing our body meant that, hey, this thing can hold water. Is it a container? It's a curved leaf. Well, it's holding a little bit of water. Now, I've made a container that emphasizes that essence I had noticed in the curved leaf, and now it holds a lot of water. Now it has a lid. Now it's, you know... We abstract from something that's basically an increasing amount of technological knowledge, which is that we want water and there's, we have places to hold it. We have food, we have a way to keep it from bugs. And you know, this is then abstracted in the mathematics. And so the error comes about because the, the fact that we assume when, and during our abstraction process where you get to ignore details we ignored the detail that there isn't a sharp boundary and we assumed a sharp boundary and then we yield a lot of productive knowledge from that and got greater and greater faith in it and we should have confidence but not faith in math confidence but not faith right. and ultimately Russell as they finally studied what they'd done and came down to realize this is all about containers. Math, as we understand it, written math, not necessarily geometry and all things we might call maths or mathematical, but this formal stuff, it's, it's pretty much all about containers. And then there's a problem with it. Because the abstraction about containers, that's why our metaphor for a container was good enough for being a human being in a forest trying to carry water from one place to another but eventually it breaks down the inherent limitations of that abstraction the impact of the facts in reality that we ignored in our abstraction has to come to bear eventually right? it has to be taken into account or it will enforce itself so that's controversy 
that is happening in logic and mathematics, a huge controversy, because after Russell's paradox, there's only one thing the mathematicians could do. Try a different foundation. And they're creating things like constructability and whatnot, and I have no doubt they will solve the technical problem. They will improve and extend set theory. You'll have you know, layers of constructability of sets, echelons of some sort, some, some artifact. But they're not, my prediction is they won't regain any hope, any real hope of getting a path where they can go deep enough into logic that they reach the bottom and they scooped out everything they needed to do down there. You'll always be able to make new abstractions, weirder abstractions, new theories of everything now that there's more things. Good old Russell. Okay, so finally, this purse example about the, uh, for example, the, the you know, the, the premise here is that um, th there is no such thing as a real tautology that has to be true. Those are features in a logical system because they've already been s assumed at the outset, things like the law of, the, ex of um, the excluded middle, you know, that it's either A or not A. So what about the purse example? My girlfriend's keys are either A, in her purse, or not A, not in her purse. But what if they're like lying on the top, half of them's hanging out the side, and you know, the half of it's hanging in the purse and it's just perched there. Is it in or out of the purse? And when you pick it up and pull it out, at what moment does it get out? You could come up with attempts to, to refine those and they'll break in other situations, you see? Because, you know, are my keys in my purse and you're looking for your keys you go over to your purse and they're lying on there it's kind of like well they were in it enough I was wondering if that's where they were at I didn't really care about in or out on the other hand you know if your purse is uh, full of you know brooches yeah no it wasn't in your purse it was on top of your purse you know it depends on what the question is there is no absolute uh, answer, we've always thought, well, we'll just come up with the rule, we'll just come up with the rule for the fuzzy cases, but no, the law of excluded middle does not apply to physics, to natural reality. Why? Because things in natural reality don't categorize like they do in logic. They don't. There's no such thing as these super sharp boundaries. You know, the, the, the line between apple and applesauce is blurry. You know, but what makes it blurry is that you're averaging together all the different reasons that you're asking that question, right? If you, if you fine tune a certain question, you know, if you're looking for a fresh apple to eat, then it's not really that even once it's a little bit crushed, right? You're looking for a whole apple. If you're looking for the vitamins of the apple, it won't really matter. I, I have an apple I've made into applesauce. Sure, yeah, good, I did find an apple. It was applesauce, but that counted for me. So that's why there's an appearance of sharp distinctions because you have something in mind when you're asking these questions. So you find these sharp distinctions and you think, well, there must be ultimate sharp distinctions. That, no. no. They're just sharp enough, just like a, a blade is not infinitely sharp, but it's sharp enough for a certain job. It's sharp enough to hack open a coconut, but not to, you know, cut a thin slice of onion, you know? It's like, it depends on how it's applied. We are now at the point, some people, in this intellectual study of logic and classification and mathematics and human thought, to realize we actually have to admit Things like mathematics don't come from the world of forms or anything like that or any other, you know, set of words that comes down functionally to the same thing. They come from our body interacting with the world. Mathematics is from abstractions of containers and other spatial abstractions and geometry. You know, it's incorporated as many abstractions as it wanted to, as it felt it needed. That wouldn't interfere with the gist of what the people using it wanted to think about. Okay, everything is like that. Everything comes down to a metaphor of things you actually interact, mundane things in the, in the real world. And to really understand how we want to use math mathematics, 
we can't chase undeniable truths. That turns out those are only undeniable after you've taken the metaphor that you got from evolution and abstraction processes. So you need to step back from that and realize, oh, I'm using these metaphors. Look how useful something like a container can be as an idea as I abstract it over and over. And not only can I use the container to carry things, but I use this pattern of a container and how it works in the world to create mathematics. But eventually you have to go, oh yeah, but I assume some things that aren't true about the real world. And you can step back and go, okay, what metaphor do we want to use next? Now that we've exhausted that metaphor and we've expanded out and we've got all of this benefit from that, you know, how do we go to the next level? And there's really no fear we're going to lose this internal thing. We're just going to refound that on something more complicated. You know, it's just like you get Einstein's theories. Did we lose Newton's theories? I mean, no. Binary thinkers like, oh, yeah, now it's false. Well, but it was always false. It was always just as useful. We figured out what the false part was. And there's probably another false part in that. And we can figure out what that is. And it gets more and more accurate. So when you make a new system, it's sort of guaranteed to regenerate the stuff you already developed to the level of accuracy you've already established. And then increase that level of accuracy. And when you work your way out there, you finally get to the boundaries again and figure out a way to reinterpret your system. And you're not just adding facts, though, that are true or undeniable. You are finding metaphors, ultimately all of which trace back to your the way you use and move your body in the real world and you're applying them out as metaphors to all of these other things and that's the revolution my friends